Okay. Yeah. Okay. So. Well, let's do the, the first one about self-compassion first. Okay. Okay. So I think it, it's quite important um, to be kind to ourselves. Yeah, be compassionate to ourselves. But being kind and compassionate to ourselves is very different than being self-indulgent. Okay, you really have to differentiate the two because self-indulgent is like what makes me feel good, what I want to do, you know, it's the whole focus is on me, I, mine, and mine, and just thinking about what gives me pleasure and benefit. Whereas self-compassion is more, you know, being kind to ourselves and involves like the way we relate to ourselves because sometimes if we look um, in the, you know in our mind when, when we can look closely there's a lot of negative self-talk you know a lot of negative kind of thoughts of oh you know I can't do this well and I can't do that well other people are better than me I'm unqualified I'm such a creep nobody's gonna love me you know um, you know, lots of, I'm never going to be a success, all this kind of uh, very negative way of relating to ourselves. And I think that's a huge hindrance for us on the path. And it's also completely wrong because we have the Buddha potential. So if we have the potential to become a fully awakened being, we aren't hopeless and helpless and, and everything. So I think self-compassion is what, you know, we learn to, to uh, acknowledge our good qualities, acknowledge our potential, but without getting all arrogant and stuck up about them, yeah, and instead saying, you know, I'm going to use my abilities to benefit sentient beings. I also recognize at this particular moment in time, I also have my limitations. Yeah, so I accept my limitations. I'm not going to criticize myself and beat myself up. Yeah, I'm a sentient being. I have limitations right now. But I also have the Buddha potential. I'm going to become fully awakened. So my limitations, my faults are not my identity. They're not a permanent part of who I am. Okay? And so I accept myself the way I am. And at the same time, I try to improve myself. Does this make some sense to you? Because when you accept yourself the way you are, I mean, <coughs> what is at the present is, so we might as well accept it. Criticizing what exists at the present doesn't do any good because it, it already exists. Yeah? So I did my best. I accept it. I accept myself with my faults. But I also know that I have a lot of good qualities, that my faults are not my nature, that I have the ability to go beyond these things and remedy my faults and develop all sorts of good qualities. And so I'm, I'm confident I have that potential. And so I'm going to go forward in my life and do that and do something good and meaningful in my life and develop my abilities. Yeah and use them for the benefit of all beings. Okay? So do you see, it's, it's, it's a way of relating to ourselves where we accept ourselves, we don't criticize ourselves, we try and improve, we see our good qualities, but we don't get stuck up about our good qualities. And we don't get complacent about them. Because we see, oh yes, there's still more work to do on the path. <laughs> hmm? Yeah, so I think that that is kind of a healthy basis for self confidence, you no? Know, because then we have the confidence that you know I have incredible potential and ability, and when you have that confidence, then wow, you can do so much. Yeah, when we just sit there and berate ourselves and oh, I'm so ugly and I'm so stupid and nobody likes me and. You know, we compare ourselves to other people and we're never as good as them and uh, 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 all that kind of stuff. Then that's like digging ourselves into a hole, digging ourselves in a hole, jumping into the hole, and then saying, Why am I in a hole? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> okay? So better not to dig ourselves the hole to start with, yeah? Let alone jump into it. Okay? Yeah? I've got a follow-up question on that, actually. Because uh -huh. um, being in mental, um, studying mental health now, um, I realized that the West has a very different approach to mental health. Mm. Like it's about observing for symptoms and categorizing people from there. Mm -hmm. And um, how, do, how do you think we should, um, how do you think it's possible to, to actually integrate the two different ways of looking at like, mental health issues? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, from the Buddhist viewpoint, as if you're a world, if you're a samsaric being, you know, who gets reborn under the force of <coughs> ignorance and afflictions and karma, you don't have optimum mental health. So from that point of view, we're all a little bit nutty. Okay? It's okay, we're among friends, we can admit it. <laughs> yeah, I'm nutty, you're nutty, what else is new? Okay? <laughs> yeah? Um... Um, but, you know, again, we don't develop an identity about it. The, the, what I've noticed in Western psychology, especially because they just came out with this new diagnostic book, what is it, yeah. DMS-5, yeah. you know, now everybody has a disorder. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely everybody. You know, you're no longer a child who, you know, you're no longer a kid. Because, I mean, kids are kids. But now you're a kid who, with a, with, what is it, a defiant, ADHD, uh, ADHD, you know, no, not, uh, not only ADHD, ADHD, but there's another one where, you know, a kid kind of who, who doesn't always cooperate. I mean, because there's lots of kids like this. Now they have a disorder called something defiant disorder. And then this one has another disorder, and that one has another disorder. And I knew, I know one mother... You know, and she had everybody in her family diagnosed, including herself. She she wasn't a psychologist, but you know, so everybody goes around diagnosing everybody else. Yeah, <laughs> somebody does something you don't like, and and then oh, now I'm a psychologist. Oh, that person's bipolar. That person has, you know, that person's obsessive compulsive. That one has narcissistic disorder. That one has this. I think it gets to be too much. And I think it, that is, can be very harmful, especially for children, because they develop a self-image of something's wrong with me, I have a disorder, and then that becomes their image, you know, throughout their life, which I think that dig, that's part of digging the hole, you know, that we jump into. So, um, also, you know, psychology and, and Buddhism psychology, the aim is for... The, for people to be happy in this life. Okay? Buddhism, the aim is for us to be free of all our mental defilements and have all happiness. So the goals of psychology and Buddhism are, are different. Some people who have very severe psychological problems, therapy can be very, very helpful for them. Yeah? And so sometimes people come to me and I do recommend they go to a therapist or a counselor. You know, because I'm not trained as a therapist or a counselor, yeah? But then other times, you know, meditation can be helpful to, for people, or simply a Buddhist perspective, you know, can be helpful. And especially, I found personally, there's uh, one genre of teachings called the thought training or mind transformation teachings. Those, I think, for me personally, were better than any therapy ever could have been. Okay, because those teachings teach you how to transform adversity into the path and teach you how to look at a situation and see that like how I am viewing the situation is what is making me suffer in it. Yeah, and that instead of seeing this situation as an objective reality that is the other person's fault, I can see, oh, I've interpreted the situation in a certain way. Given that interpretation, then I suffer. If I look at the situation in another way, 
I don't have to suffer. Okay? So, for example, a, f a very dear friend criticizes me. Yeah? You had that happen? Somebody you really care about, you know, turns on you, talks behind your back, criticizes you. Yeah? And so then we usually get so angry, we blame this person, how dare they do that, this is so wrong. We go and tell all of our other friends so that they'll hate that person too, and they'll be on our side. And, you know, and, and everything gets really stirred up and agitated, and we drag everybody else into our conflict with one other person. Yeah? And still, even though we do all of this, still we're unhappy. Yeah, talking badly about the person behind their back d doesn't stop our unhappiness. And in fact, it just makes the other person angrier, so then they're going to do more stuff we don't like. So it actually makes the situation worse. Yeah. Whereas if I stop and I say, okay, I'm getting criticized. Yeah. When the... When something happens to me, whether it's a, a very good situation or a very bad situation, it's due to my karma, meaning it's due to the actions that I've done in previous times, either earlier this life or in previous lives. Okay? So if somebody's criticizing me now, it probably indicates that in the past I've criticized other people. Okay? you know, I threw the energy out there, it's coming back to me. <coughs> then I sit and examine, okay, have I, do I criticize other people? What do you think? Do you criticize other people? Yes. Yeah? <laughs> we criticize other people, don't we? Yeah? And I don't know about you, but I criticize several people every day. <laughs> yeah? <coughs> every day. Well, what's this person doing? What's that? I don't like this. I don't like that. <laughs> you know? So I look. Every day I'm criticizing people. Am I getting criticized by other people every day? No. I only, get, I only receive criticism once in a while. I give criticism a lot. <laughs> yeah. So all this criticism that I'm dishing out to other people is now coming back to me in by 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 my getting criticized and you know the real cause of it is my criticizing other people, you know, my anger, my jealousy, my self-centeredness. So I myself created the chief cause for these problems. Yeah? There's no reason to blame the other person. Yeah, there's no reason because I created the cause by criticizing other people. So now I accept I created that cause. I just have to bear the result. Yeah? Not blame the other person, not get angry, not talk bad about them behind their back. Maybe I need to talk to them and try and clear up the situation, but I don't need to stir the pot anymore and create more conflict. Okay? Plus, yeah, if I don't like being criticized, then I should stop creating the cause to be criticized. So that means I need to be more careful in my life and not criticize so many other people all the time. Yeah, because every time I criticize and blame somebody else, I'm creating the cause to receive that myself. So if I don't like the, the result, I better not create the cause. So you see, if I, if I think like that, then, you know, somebody criticizes me, it becomes much easier for me to handle the situation. Yeah? Because I'm not into, oh, they said this terrible thing about me. What are other people going to think? Am I really that bad? Oh, dear, I'm such a horrible person. Or how dare they think me? I'm a, think I'm a horrible person. I'm not that bad. And 
all this confusion in the mind doesn't even happen. Because I just say, it's a result of my own actions. Yeah? That's it. Okay? So in many ways I find the thought training teaching so effective for uh, dealing with problems. Yeah? Because it stops me from feeling like a victim. Mm -hmm. When I blame other people, I make myself into a victim. Okay. Does this make some sense? Mm -hmm. Do you think that the origins of that criticism of others is just purely from our own criticism of ourselves, or do you think it's more complex than that? I think very often, when we're very self-critical, then it's easy to project it outwards on other people. Yeah. It quite often goes together. Yeah. yeah. Um, how do you how do you explain karma to someone who was born with disabil disability physically? You yeah. Can't say you did something, did some bad karma. Right. Like right. I wouldn't if I were teaching somebody the Dharma and they weren't. <clears throat> they didn't know the Dharma already, I would not start off teaching karma. <laughs> yeah? Because that isn't what's going to be helpful to that person. Yeah? So somebody who has a great suffering, who is not Buddhist, you don't start off teaching them about karma. Yeah? Because they, they can't take it at that point. You have to start off teaching about loving kindness, compassion, you know, how all sentient beings are equal and wanting happiness and not suffering. You know, how to open the heart and be kind and appreciate other people. You talk about that. Then later, 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 when people have, you know, they've begun practicing, <clears throat> they've found the Dharma helpful, then you can start introducing ideas about karma. But you don't walk up to somebody who's disabled and say, you know, you must have like, done something really awful in your previous life. You know, I mean, that's just not skillful or helpful. Okay? Okay, let me go back to that second question about what is purposeful in life. Okay. Can I just ask you, when you were referring to the thought um, training teachings, um, were you referring to, is that something in the Buddhist? Yeah, mind or training or mind thought training? training. Yeah, there's a whole genre of teachings like that. Some of the texts in the, well, the book, um, Don't Believe Everything You Think, It's uh, it contains a Tibetan poem, and that poem is one of them. There's another one, um, Wheel of Sharp Weapons. I'm currently working on a manuscript about that text. Um, seven Point Thought Transformation. Yeah. Eight verses of mind training. Uh, what else is there? Oh, I, this is what I was recommending to you. On the, um, there's a text called uh, Mind Training, like Rays of the Sun. Yeah. If you go on shravasti.org and click under the video teachings, you can find a whole series of, of talks on that text. Yeah, so that's all really very, very helpful. Yeah. I mean, when I look, I think that those teachings are what saved me. Yeah. I, when I went into the Dharma, I was angry, I was depressed, you know. I was worse than I was, well, than I am now. So those teachings really helped tremendously. Okay, now as to what's meaningful, you know, this other person's um, uh, question. From a, I'm talking from a Buddhist viewpoint now, okay? And we have a precious human life with all the potential to learn the Dharma, meditate, actualize the teachings, really transform ourselves and even become fully awakened Buddhists, okay? So we have like all the good conditions to practice right now. And our life doesn't last forever. Yeah? Our life is of a limited amount. We don't know how long. Yeah? Our death is definite. 
And death happens to everybody. It doesn't matter who you are. Yeah, there's no place we can go to, to be free of death. Yeah, it's just a natural occurrence. Yeah. And we don't know when it's going to happen. It could happen any time. So when we think, you know, we have this incredible, amazing circumstance now of having the possibility and potential to practice the Dharma, and yet this opportunity is not going to exist forever, and we don't know when it's going to stop. And at the time we die, you know, what is it that we take with us? What's important when we die? Yeah? Do you take your body with you when you die? No. All your clothes, all your jewelry, you know, everything you do to look attractive. Yeah. <laughs> Home your team, he's going to point at that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah? Your high heels. Your <laughs> you know? All this stuff. Does, <laughs> yeah? Does any of that stuff come with us? Unless you're Chinese, then you're... You can burn the paper. But it still doesn't come with you. I kid you not, I went home recently and I went to a ch because it's Chinese New Year, I went back to Singapore, to Singapore. And we went past the George Stock and they're selling iPhones. I know. <laughs> and charges to burn. Uh, yeah, can I make a correction? Yeah. Uh -huh. Actually, in the ancient time, they burn all the paper stuff uh -huh. to show the people who are living to show that when they die, all this cannot go with them. Yeah. But the mm. message has been distorted uh, by the time because now we are living in a commercial yeah. world. Uh -huh. It's more like um, the visual lessons for the people who have been left behind. Behind, yeah. Yeah, because that's exactly it. That None of it does come with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all of it stays here. So you spend your whole life working for all this material stuff you know, your possessions, <coughs> your good looks, all of that, none of it comes with you. Yeah? None of it. It's impossible for any of it to come with. Yeah. So that makes us, like, ask ourselves, well, you know, what am I doing with my time? Yeah? Trying to look a certain way, be a certain way, when none of that is really going to matter at the end of the day. And especially, you know, looks and beauty and this kind of thing, we're losing it even while we're alive. Because we're all aging, aren't we? None of us are getting younger. We're all aging. Yeah? Every one of us, we're in the process of getting more wrinkles, gray hair, body not as strong. Yeah, I know when you're young you think... <laughs> That's not going to happen to me. Yeah, I'm going to be young and attractive forever. Forget it. <laughs> That's not what happens. Yeah. Have you ever looked at pictures of your parents? Yeah? And can you imagine your parents ever looked like that? You know, it's hard to imagine that they're they... very good looking. Yeah. <laughs> you don't look like that. <laughs> you know, we look at our parents, we just, did they ever look like that? How is that possible? So one day, you know, if we live that long, people are going to look at our pictures and go, Wow, <laughs> you used to look like that. Isn't that interesting? Look at them now. <laughs> you know? Okay? So it really makes you think, you know, well, what am I doing with my time? You know, what am I putting my energy into? Because a lot of that stuff is just, it's not going to last for a long time. It's going to disappear. Yeah? And if I create my whole identity, out of having a lot of material goods, out of being attractive, out, out of having a, a high social standard. If that's my identity, then as I age and I start to lose those things, then what's going to happen to me? Yeah. 
I think of the athletes especially, you know, because the athletes, when they're young, I mean, like Michael Phelps, yeah, remember the Olympic guy? So, you know, when he's young, wow, look, he won so many Olympic gold medals, this guy's fantastic. <laughs> Is he ever going to be able to do that again? No. You know, his body's going downhill. Someday, he's going to be some old man, you know, if he lives that long. Yeah, with a cane and gray hair and drooped over. Yeah, what does it mean to you then? Oh, can you brag then? Oh, I won all these Olympic gold medals. It, you know, if your identity is that, that, you know, I'm this great athlete, then as you age, your aging process is going to be so painful because you're losing all of that. Yeah, and there's no way to gain it back. Just on that point, Venerable, there's a famous Australian swimmer, Ian Thorpe, mm -hmm. who is like Michael Phelps, and mm -hmm. he's actually going through depression right now. Mm -hmm. A lot of it was because he tried to come back a few years after he retired to the Olympics and he never made it. Mm -hmm. and so I think he's dealing with that sort of same issue. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's it. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it, it, it produces suffering this life, and it produces suffering in the future, too. So our body doesn't come with us. Our possessions definitely don't come with us. Yeah, my mom died about five and a half years ago. I was visiting my, my dad right before I came here. So I was in my parents' bedroom and I opened one drawer, I was looking for something. And there's all these purses that my mom used to have. You know, so many purses. I, I just looked at them and I thought, wow, you know. She's gone five and a half years. All these purses are here. She thought that they were going to make her happy. Yeah? Some of them were pretty beaded purses, and you know. And this, I thought, wow, she thought they were going to make her happy. And now who knows where the continuity of her mind stream is, what realm she's born in, what she's experiencing now. I don't know. But all those purses just, you know, are taking up space in the house. Yeah. So it is like that. And then even our friends and relatives, you know, they can't come with us when we die either. You know, because, you know, we all know that when we die, we separate. Our mind goes on alone. So our friends and relatives can, can be really helpful if they encourage us to practice the Dharma, if they encourage us to be generous and to create good karma and not to lie and cheat and things like that. Then our relatives are really helping us. Yeah? But if our friends and relatives are just, just become objects of attachment and then we lie you know, in order to protect the relationships with them, or we cheat other people in order to get more for our family, or we talk behind people's back because they, you know, talk behind one of our friends and rel or relatives' back. You know, so in relationship to the people we care about, if we're not careful, we can create a lot of negative karma. And we can also spend a lot of time, yeah, go to the movies, go on vacation, the Australia has such nice beaches, you can lie on the beach, you know, you can go to Tasmania, you can, you know, grow bonsai trees, you can, you know, there's so many things you can do with your friends and relatives, you've got to keep up with all the latest movies so that you have something to talk with people about, but at the end of the day, does any of that really matter? doesn't, does it? You know? Whether you have all the latest movies and all the latest songs, does that matter when you die? No. Okay? The only thing that goes with us is the seeds of our actions, our karmic seeds. Okay? And also our mental habits. What kind of thought training we did. What kind of mental habits we're cultivating in our mind. You know, that comes with us. That's also part of the mental karma. 
And that's what, you know, everything else stays behind. So then when we realize that, then we have to ask ourselves, well, what, what am I doing? You know, am I creating a lot of virtue with my time? You know, being generous, keeping good ethical conduct, learning fortitude, developing concentration and joyous effort and understanding the Dharma and sharing the Dharma with others. Am I doing things, you know, beneficial things for sentient beings and creating good karma? Or am I, you know, getting angry, being fussy, criticizing other people, cheating other people to get something for myself, yeah, being rude and inconsiderate, and, you know, yeah, killing animals, for example, you know, to have a seafood dinner or, you know, doing all sorts of unethical things. Yeah, so what am I doing with my time? What kind of actions am I creating? And what kind of results are these actions going to bring? Yeah, and if, if I just say to myself, Oh, well, I'm a, you know, I'm an angry person. There's nothing to do about it. Everybody just has to accept that I'm angry. You know, am I creating an identity? And then am I going to be really happy dying as an angry person? Yeah? When you die, do you want to die angry? I don't want to. So if I don't want to die angry, why to hold on to grudges now? Why spend so much time getting angry at people now? It doesn't make any sense. Yeah? If, you know, do I, do I want to die greedy, you know? Thinking, I mean, here's one story that I'll tell you. I thought this was so sad. In 1959, many of the Tibetans, they f had to flee Tibet because the communist Chinese took over the government. So, um... Uh, when I lived in India, one, I knew one Tibetan woman, and uh, her father died. And on, before he died, on his deathbed, he was trying to tell her, because when he had left Tibet, he had taken some gold with him. He had buried it somewhere. And he was, as he was dying, he was trying to tell, tell her, where he had buried this gold. And I thought, wow, you know, what suffering to die thinking about clinging onto this gold. And, you know, will my daughter find the gold? I want her to find it. I don't want the gold to be lost. You know, this poor man died with that kind of thought in his mind. Hmm? Yeah, so to, to really think, you know, what, how do I want to die? What, you know, do I want to die angry? Do I want to die greedy? Do I want to die worried about who's going to take this and that from the house? Yeah, or worried about, you know, what's going to happen to my kids? What's going to happen to my spouse? Uh, I don't know about you, but I don't want to die worrying about those things. Okay, so that means if I don't want to die about the worrying about those things, then I have to really work on cutting my attachment right now, reducing my anger, my you know, the, comparing myself to others, criticizing others. I have to really reduce that right now. Yeah, we can still enjoy things. There's nothing wrong with enjoying things. But it's the attachment that creates so much problem because the attachment doesn't let our mind be free. Yeah, Without attachment, we have something nice, we enjoy it, it finishes, fine. You don't think twice about it. With attachment, I want this, I've got to have that, how am I going to get this? You get it? Oh, wow, look at me, I have this, don't I look good, isn't this fantastic? I hope other people see how wonderful and successful I am. And then when we die and lose it, oh no, all this stuff, I can't take it with me. Other people are going to have it, oh no, I don't want these people to have it, I want those people to have it. 
Okay, so attachment creates all that kind of suffering for us in this life and then, you know, creating so much negative karma out of the, you know, because of the attachment. Huh? So, whereas, you know, if we live just with a mind, you know, have our, our principal intention, be a mind that wants to benefit others, yeah, I want to benefit other sentient beings. What can I do that benefits sentient beings? Yeah. I want to perfect my wisdom. I want to develop, you know, the qualities of a Buddha within myself. I want to purify the negative karma I've already created so that it doesn't ripen. Yeah. So then this becomes very important in our life to do. Hmm. Make some sense? Yeah? yeah? And so I think especially because, you know, you're all young, this is really important to think about. Yeah? Even the old ones who are still young at heart. <laughs> yeah? Because it's never too late. <laughs> yeah? But it's, you know, but it's especially, you know, when you're young and you're thinking about what am I going to do with my life? And thinking yeah. about what your goals are. To, you know, to think very clearly about what your goals are, what your values and principles are, what's important to you in life. And it doesn't matter what the rest of society says, you know? Everybody else can have all the opinions they want about your life, but you're the one living your life, and you're the one who has to make the decisions about it. Yeah, you can't live your life trying to please everybody else and live the life that they want you to lead. Yeah, you have to be really true to your own heart. Because it's a very precious opportunity that we have. Because a, a precious human life isn't just anybody who's born human. I mean, there's seven billion of us on this planet. But very few people have a precious human life. Because a precious human life has all the conditions to be able to learn and practice the Dharma. How many people have all those conditions? You know, if you've ever gone to Bogaya, you know, the, the holiest site on this planet, you'll see people who, who are in Bodhgaya selling all these little Buddhist figurines and everything like that. For them, you know, the stupa and Bogaya is just a place to make money. How can I make money off of this and off of the tourists? <coughs> no interest in the Dharma. No faith in the Buddha. They're right there in Bodh Gaya. Their mind's completely obscured with ignorance. Yeah? So, you know, when you really think about it, it's the, the fact that we're even interested in the Dharma. You know, I had one friend, you know, I, Okay, we're interested in the Dharma and we have the opportunity to practice, to learn the Dharma. One of my friends, before the Soviet uh, bloc fell, yeah, he would go there into to some of the Soviet countries and teach the Dharma. But he had to do it very secretively. So he told me that they would meet in somebody's house, but everybody had to come at a different time not like all of you, you all kind of came at the same time and came together. No, couldn't do that because that would attract the suspicion of the police. So they had to come individually at one, you know, different times. And then when they got into the friend's apartment, their flat, in the living room, you know, right when you open the door, they would set up a table with cards, like they were playing card games. And, and have drinks there and, you know, snacks. Then they would go in the back room in the bedroom and have the Dharma teaching. And if the police ever came, they could run out quickly and sit down and pretend like they were pl playing cards. You know? Like, so forget having temples and Dharma, you know, Dharma freely available. I mean, just to have to have teachings under these circumstances with so much fear? 
Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we're so fortunate. We live in free countries. Oh, the Dharma, I mean, there's so much Dharma here in Australia. And you can do so much. When I learned the Dharma, you know, 1975, back with the dinosaurs, um, you know, there, there were hardly any Buddhist centers in the U.S. I mean, my teachers were on tour. I met them. And then, what am I going to do? How am I going to learn the Dharma now? The only thing I could do was pack my bags and go to Nepal and India. I went halfway around the world because that was what I had to do. Yeah, You guys have so much here. Plus, you have the Internet. <laughs> yeah, if you're not involved <laughs> like this all the time. <laughs> all of us. Yeah. It was just funny, like the preparation of the conference. I had to really talk about logistics and everything. And because I'm a teacher, so I can't actually check the messages. <laughs> you <skipped out>. oh. <laughs> when I finish my class and then I check my mobile phone, there were 140 unread messages. I thought, how am I supposed to do this all of them? I just, I just started ignoring the messages. I will read it. Uh, the they were important. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like most of the time it's going round and round and round and round. But then I thought, you know, they, they, they can't have been very productive. <laughs> teacher, you know, your students are all doing this while your class is going on. <laughs> 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 really like I'm a teacher trainer at the moment, so my, oh. my students are teachers <laughs> to me. So. Okay. <laughs> you tell a student, 10 minutes, right? You read. <laughs> yeah. Free for all. <laughs> it's like, I will go sleep early, I will switch off the internet, because I will, if, if, it's like, I'm very sensitive, if there's a vibration or I will wake up. So I will switch off the internet. Yeah. And these people will be chatting <laughs> on to 1, 2 a.m. in the morning. And I turn on the message at 7 a.m. in the morning and it's like there are hundred, like at least 50 messages. Yeah. At least. And it'll take me five minutes. And Rupert, a friend of us, actually Okay, texts okay I have to, in the ex excuse me for a minute. Yeah, I, I want to get back to the questions here. Yeah. yeah, and continue as a question and answer session. Excuse yeah. me. Yeah. Okay. I have a question. A lot of times with our Buddhist practice is about self-contemplation, but how we can extend it to people around us, especially those ones that we think really need the teaching. Mm. For example, I know somebody who is close to me who have an addiction problem, mm -hmm. not to drugs, um, thankfully, not to substance, but to something else. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I don't know which channel I can poke and introduce a little bit Dharma or even kindness or even mm -hmm. the beautiful quality of the hearts. Yeah. Do you have any advice on that? Okay. Um, well, first of all, on a practical level, there's things like AA for almost any addiction now. For yeah, shopping. But yeah. Where he lives, those helps are not available. Well, check, because there's AA groups everywhere, you know, and those kind of groups. In any case, um, one thing you can do is leave Dharma books around. Maybe yeah. they'll, they'll pick them up. Or you can just talk about Dharma. A little, you know, you can say, hey, I went to this conference last weekend. Let me tell you what I heard people say. Yeah, and you, you bring up a Dharma topic and discuss with the person. But okay. what I find is that it's really hard to reach out when he himself doesn't realize that he has a problem. Yeah, then there's very little you can do. If somebody is not willing to recognize and own that they have a problem, it's very difficult. Can you dedicate yeah. marriage to them? Would that help? What you can do is there's a meditation called the taking and giving meditation that you can do. Or... There's a meditation that, that we do in Tibetan Buddhism where you visualize the Buddha on the crown of somebody's head and imagine light and nectar from the Buddha coming into the, that person, purifying their negative karma, giving them the realizations of the Buddha. And then we say the Buddha's mantra at the time we do that. Or you can visualize Kuan Yin, Avalokiteshvara on somebody's head, say you know, that mantra. 
Yeah, that can be helpful. You can pray and dedicate for that person's benefit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very little we can do when somebody is not. Yeah, when somebody is not ready to change, mm -hmm. you can do backflips and handstands <coughs> and fly to the moon, and it won't have any much effect. Yeah. And this is what, uh, you know, because I work with people in prison, and this is what they tell me that, you know, because many of them have, have had addiction problems of one sort or another, that until they hit rock bottom, then they often, they may even go to, to treatment, but they don't take it seriously. Mm. Yeah. Until they really hit rock bottom and like, boy, my life is a mess, I have to do something then they'll start to listen. So, yeah, because our motivation is the most important thing. For anything we do in life, our motivation is the most important because that's what gets us going in a direction. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question following on from that? Um, mm -hmm. Often, so the person himself uh, may not realize or, or admit that they have a problem, mm -hmm. um, but it can Yeah, it's, it's, it's very painful and it's very difficult for people who care about somebody to watch that person dig themselves a hole. <laughs> and it's often uh, very difficult to do anything. Um, this is one, one reason why I really recommend for parents, when they're bringing up their kids, make sure that there's other adults in the child's life. Because sometimes it happens that the kid runs into a problem and they don't want to go to their parents because the, the relationship with the parents and the family is too sticky. But if when they were growing up there's other adults maybe who were family friends or whatever, neighbors, that the children knew, they, the, they feel more comfortable going to that person who's not so attached to them who isn't going to pressure them, who isn't going to scold them. Okay, so this is just talking a little bit on the side of prevention. Yeah, to make sure that children have many different adults in their life that they can go to and, and talk to. Um, I think also for, for the people, it's, it's due to attachment that we suffer when we see somebody else digging themselves a hole. Okay? We're very attached to them. We don't want them to suffer, but we also want them to do something else. We have kind of an agenda for them. And, um, <coughs> you know, often the attachment cre can create a lot of suffering because we get into this dynamic where we try and rescue the other person. Yeah, they play the victim. We play the rescuer. They go downhill, we swoop in, we save them, then they do the same thing again, then we swoop in and we save them. This is called an enabler, it's called codependent behavior. And so sometimes what is the kindest thing to do is to stop doing that. And that's very difficult because when you stop doing what is saving the person, that person might really hit flat bottom. Yeah, but it's kind of the risk that you have to take to do it. Yeah, I, uh, one of the, the in, no, was it one of the guys? I can't remember who told me this, this story. It must have been one of the guys I work with. But he was always getting into trouble as a teenager, you know, getting arrested by the police, getting hauled into the police station. You know, and his mother would always come and bail him out, take him home. He would go be before the court and have to pay a fee, and she would pay the fee and take him home. And this kept on happening repeatedly. And then one time, 
you know, he was before the judge, and, you know, the judge was saying, you know, either you pay this fee or he's going to stay in prison. And he was underage. He was a juvenile. And she, the mother looked at the judge and said, you know, I can't deal with this anymore. You keep him this time. Mm-hmm. And the boy went like, what? What? My mother's not going to rescue me? I'm going to have to be responsible for the result of my own behavior? Yeah, because the mother just said, I can't handle it. You know, you keep him. And so that really was a big wake-up call for him. Yeah. So sometimes you have to be like that. When somebody is, is really misbehaving and, you know, you're in this very sticky, polluted relationship of being, you know, victim and rescuer. Then there's always a perpetrator, too, somebody who's perpetrating. And, yeah, and it just, and you have to break that dynamic by refusing to play your part. Venerable, would you say that sometimes it's also the family not recognizing the person's faults? Because I, my mm-hmm. mother's uncle passed away recent, uh, a couple of years ago. He was a lifelong alcoholic. Um, mm-hmm. When he, my maternal grandmother was staying with him and his wife, you know, the relationships was really very bad. My cousin was around my age and yeah. he was sleeping with him. If I could reply to, to your initial yes. thing, yes, I think you're, you're really spot on there that very often because of the attachment, the family has for one family mm-hmm. member, then they don't want to acknowledge that that person has a serious problem. Because my mother to this yeah. day will not acknowledge that he had an issue. Yeah, and again, if somebody won't acknowledge it, yeah, you can try and bring it up. Very often they refuse to listen. Mm. Yeah, you can, in many of these things, you can, you can do what you can to do, try to do, but, yeah, so, you know what I find very interesting is so often in question and answer sessions, people ask me about how to help other people with their problems. Because <laughs> <laughs> we're all perfect, that's why we're sitting here. I'm yes. Do something for myself. Yes. <laughs> you have time. Yes. Well, uh, in terms of, um, from your point of view, of what the Buddha taught mm-hmm. for the part of the liberation, Mm-hmm. What is the right view of the thing that we should understand and do now so we can cultivate the wisdom to attend the liberation? Yeah, excellent question. Thank you. So, um, first, it, you know, is to keep very good ethical conduct. You know, take the five precepts, keep the five precepts. A very effective practice is at the beginning of the day when you first wake up, to set your motivation very strongly and to think today the most important thing is that I don't harm anybody else. Yeah. Also, there can be more than one most important thing. Second most <laughs> yeah? There can be more. Second most important thing is that I be of as much benefit to others as I can be. Third most important thing is that I really cultivate the bodhicitta, the aspiration for full awakening for the benefit of all beings. And I want to to live with those three things prominent in my mind today. And so you generate that motivation when you first wake up in the morning, before you even get out of bed. If you think you're going to forget, Put it on your cell phone <laughs> and have the, you know, have the bell go off, you know, 10 minutes after you wake up and, and have your motivation play to you and you stop and reflect on your motivation, you know. And when you first get up, take refuge in the Buddha Dharma Sangha. Okay, so you start the day off in a really good way like that. Then throughout the day, periodically check in with your motivation and say, how am I doing? Yeah. Then at the end of the day, sit down and look over the whole day and really review it. 
and think, okay, I, I had the motivation not to harm anybody or <clears throat> get irritated with other people. How, how well was I able to do that? Well, yeah, I kind of said something nasty to so-and-so today. So then we develop regret. And remember I talked about the four opponent powers? Those of you who at, were at the, the talk at the Buddhist library? Didn't I talk about, was that the, somewhere in Sydney I talked about the four opponent powers. Anyway, read either Open Heart, Clear Mind, or Buddhist, Buddhism for Beginners. They're in there. 20 bucks for today. <laughs> Okay, um, and so you purify, you know, whatever negative karma we created, we purify it in the evening. We think, okay, if that kind of situation happens again, what, how else can I look at it so that I don't, you know, do that negative action again? As, if we, as we look back on the day and evaluate, we may say, well, yeah, I got mad at so-and-so, which wasn't so great, I want to purify that. But I didn't say anything nasty to them. That's progress. Good. <laughs> you know, you pat yourself on the back. Good. You know, it's very important that we rejoice in our own virtue. Okay? So, we, and so if we do that, then we, we really keep on top of things in our life. Because we start out the day with a good motivation. We keep coming back to it during the day. We evaluate at the end of the day and we make a new resolution for how we want to be the next day. Yeah? And so in that way we really learn and we develop our qualities yeah, on the foundation of ethical conduct. Then we also practice generosity as much as we can, sharing what we have. That's a very easy way to create merit. Yeah? Then... Um, we, we train in, um, in patience or fortitude. In other words, how to subdue our anger, how to develop internal mental strength, even for situations when we face suffering. Yeah. We do train the mind in joyous effort, taking delight in virtue. Yeah. So, you know, part of generosity, part of joyous effort, you make, you know, if you have a shrine at home, you make offerings to the Buddha every morning. Yeah, you take some food or you take the water bowls or candle or flowers or something. You make offerings to the Buddha. You think all the Buddhas in the universe. You think actually on every atom there's a Buddha surrounded by Buddhas and surrounded by bodhisattvas. On every atom of existence and you're making beautiful offerings to all of them. Incredible way to start the day, imagining all this beauty and all these holy beings around you. Yeah. And, uh, you know, then have a daily meditation practice. Study the Dharma, you know, learn about it. Uh, go on retreats when you can or extended courses when you can. Train in <coughs> wisdom, train in concentration. So the path has a lot of different elements to it. But the idea is just start and do the best we can and keep going. Yeah. Some people say, oh, but it's hard. Hard doesn't matter. We've done many <coughs> hard things in our life. And samsara is much harder than practicing the Dharma. Yeah. So difficult doesn't make, is no excuse. Yeah. Because if you practice, you're definitely going in the right direction. So you can be happy about that. You can feel like you're doing something useful in your life because you're becoming a better person. Yeah. Then you have satisfaction and contentment in your life. You can rejoice in your virtue. Hmm? You don't have so many regrets. You were talking about the motivation of um, wanting to benefit other people and also wanting to uh, like your own spiritual development mm -hmm. and it seems to me that both of those things need to be developed together yes and it would be very easy to get it out of balance and yeah. if you're if you're someone that does a lot of work to help other people it could be quite easy to think that you were in a place where you were able to help people more than you were um like 
to think that you didn't need to attend as much to your spiritual mm. development or or and it could because there's so much suffering out there mm. and once you start helping people you could get drawn into more and more and then easily neglect the other aspect yeah. or you could go the yeah. other way like mm. how do you know if you're how do you prevent? <laughs> yeah, well, you have. This is the whole thing of finding the middle way. Yeah. yeah, and because I think when you're involved in helping others, you really have to keep your own spiritual practice very strong. Otherwise, at the end, you get exhausted and collapse, and you lose your med- your motivation. Yeah, and at the same time, you're practicing the Dharma. It's also good to do something active to benefit. Because then you can see how well your practice is going. Because am I getting, you know, I'm trying to help people or do some virtuous practice. Am I getting mad at people? Hmm. Well, I am. This is something I need to work on in my practice. Okay, so it helps us do some kind of assessment, too, and see what we need to work on. Okay. I think we're going to have to end because... I'm leaving tomorrow morning on the plane. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's been really wonderful, wonderful to be with all of you and see your enthusiasm. And thank you so much for everything you did to, to organize the conference. You know, it was very well done and, and went very smoothly. And I think many people learned a lot and were happy about it. So thank you all very much for that. Please continue. Yeah. You're all welcome to visit the Abbey. <laughs> yeah. And there's lots of stuff online. <clears throat> You're looking at your iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> now we have her attention. <laughs> because I saw I saw the notice of something that's all. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let's just do a dedication. Mm -hmm. So let's really rejoice at the merit and the virtue we created together. And let's send it out into the universe to each and every living being. Due to this merit, may we soon attain the awakened state of Guru Buddha that we may be able to liberate all sentient beings from their suffering. May the precious Bodhi mind not yet born arise and grow. May that born have no decline, but increase forevermore.